Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. For thee all the follies of sin I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior art To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things, says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1, and seven, 1 through 7. Thank you. I'd like you to turn now to Revelation chapter 2. going to begin this next section of the book of Revelation, which deals with the seven churches. One of the questions that you might have is why was the church of Ephesus the first church that Jesus addressed? And although we're not told in the scriptures exactly why, I would like to at least give some possible reasons for this that may help us in understanding also the, the church of Ephesus. But before we do that, let's, let's have a word of prayer. 
Father, we thank you that we can meet here today as your children, as the body of Christ, the church. Lord, we know we are, in a sense, like one of these churches. 2,000 years later, we, we are, there are believers all over the world that are meeting in these assemblies and worshiping their Savior and their God, listening to the Word of God. And Father, I pray that we would listen to this passage that was written to a church. And may we evaluate our own lives by it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the reasons John may have been writing to the church of Ephesus first was the fact that this church was the most important city in Asia Minor. So it would have been a strategic lo location for a church. It's very possible that this church was maybe a larger church than some of the others, not, not to to say that it's more important than others because it was larger, but simply that it was uh, a church that both John and the Apostle Paul had a significant part in. In fact, of all the churches where Paul ministered, this was the church where he was there the longest. He was there for three years discipling people, and we'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment. But Paul came to Ephesus on the third missionary journey, and he firmly established this church that Aquila and Priscilla had started in their own home. After Paul left this church, Timothy came and pastored it for probably a year to a year and a half, and it was plagued after that by uh, false doctrine or false teachers, um, fables and endless genealogies. They, these false teachers taught aesthetic, ascetic and unscriptural ideas like forbidding marriage or forbidding certain mo uh, foods. And because of that, there were disputes and but also at this church, there were some amazing things that happened, at least in the area of Ephesus. There were 12 men who came to Ephesus, and they had only known the baptism of John the Baptist, and Paul told them for the first th time about Christ, and about that John the Baptist was simply a forerunner of Christ. And so now they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and they were believers in him. It says the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Then Paul went into a synagogue, and he spoke boldly there for three months, persuading them about Jesus Christ. But the Jews became hardened and spoke evil of Christianity before the multitudes. And so he eventually departed not from Ephesus, but from that synagogue. And it says he went to the school of Tyrannus and he taught there for two years daily. And this is what it said as when he did that, so that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. That's significant. God worked in other unusual ways. It says that there People would bring handkerchiefs and aprons from his body to the sick, and they would be healed. Many of those who practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And it says that the value of those books totaled 50,000 pieces of silver or drachmas. That would, one, one drachma equaled a day's wage. And if we were to measure that in silver today, 
it would be worth about two or three million pounds sterling. And it says, the word of the Lord grew mightily. But the last recorded thing that Paul experienced in Ephesus was his offense to the worshipers of the goddess Diana. And Ephesus was the, uh, was the location of the great temple for Diana. In fact, that, that theater, that huge edifice seated 25,000 people. Paul had seen so many saved out of the wicked religion of that worship that the silversmiths who made the idols of Diana were angry over their decrease in sales. And so they created such a riot in that city that even the city officials had to come and quiet things down. And then Paul determined that he would leave the believers there and go to Macedonia. Also remember that this church in Ephesus was the church that John pastored before he was sent to the Isle of Patmos. It was dear to his heart. This was, but this was a message from the Lord. It wasn't so much a message from John as it was from Jesus himself. But he knew these people. And I wonder how he was thinking when the Lord was giving his own evaluation of that church that he had pastored. It could be that the Lord began with this church because the offense that they were guilty of is foundational to all the other sins that the other churches had committed. Whatever we learn from these churches, we need to realize that even the best of churches who even had an apostle pastoring it, had problems. And that's because churches are made up of what? Of sinners. Of which the pastors are sinners. The deacons are sinners. Everyone is a saved sinner. And just like Jesus had sinners as disciples and he had problems with them during the three years that he was training them. They were a motley crew. They had little faith. They were selfish. They were glory seekers. They were impatient with others. They ran from the Lord. In his dying hour. And many of these churches are just like us. And so as we, we learn of these churches, we we need to listen and evaluate and examine ourselves. Who is this letter addressed to? All right, I wanted to make sure that you understood that, that he, he really addresses this to the pastor. The recipient of the message is the pastor. The word angel here, look at verse 1, to the angel of the church at Ephesus, right. And the one speaking is who? It's Jesus Christ. The word angel here literally means messenger or tidings. He also calls this the star, the stars. He, um, he mentions that in chapter one. But this word angel refers to it usually refers to an angelic being. And it's used throughout the book of Revelation for that meaning. However, it can refer to a pastor. In this first description, that is the word star, which was really a mystery until he tells us that these stars are the seven angels of the churches. What does a star and a lampstand have in common? What's that? They give light in a dark place, don't they? Both of them do. The pastor gives light through several things. First of all, he proclaims the word of God, and the word of God gives light. 
He proclaims the gospel, and the gospel gives light. And he is to have a godly life that is, should give light. The word angel, that, as I mentioned before, the Greek word there literally means tidings. The Greek word is angelos. It's, it's a, really a transcription or transliteration of the word angel, our English word. The word gospel, the root word is the same word that's used here for, for angel. But it has a, free, a prefix on it. And that prefix adds this meaning to it. It means good tidings. That's why the gospel is called good tidings. It's good news. But it's the same word. And then the word evangelist. Now think of the word evangelist right now. And what, what word is in that word? Angel. And it comes from the same word. And what it, but it has that prefix on it, and it means one who brings good tidings. So an evangelist is an angel who brings good tidings, the good tidings of the gospel. This pastor was being given an important message about the church that he shepherded and cared for. How would you like to receive that evaluation of your church? It'd be sobering. Why was it delivered to the pastor? Why not the church? Well, let me just say one thing very quickly. Was this only for the pastor? Look at the the end of the chat or at the end of this passage, verse seven. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this message wasn't just for the pastor, it was for the churches. But it was given to the pastor first. And he was to give this message, he was to act upon it, he was to first of all examine his own life by means of what was being said and then he was to give it to the churches. It's given to the pastor because the pastor would someday give an account before the great shepherd who walks in the midst of the lampstands. Part of his stewardship for which he would be held accountable would be the administration and oversight of that church as taught in scripture. And when Paul was um, exhorting Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ that you preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, rebuke, reprove, and so forth. The pastor, Timothy, at that time was, the, was to do that. And he was to train faithful men, women, who would be able to teach others also. And as I mentioned before, he, it was given to the pastor because he was first to take heed to it himself. The author of the message we already saw is Jesus Christ himself. He is the person of that vision in chapter 1, the one who is walking in the midst of the churches, the one who holds the stars in his right hand. But notice that each description of himself, his description of himself in this passage is related to the problem revealed in his message. And every address to each church in each of those, Jesus Christ relates something of what was seen in the vision in chapter 1 to that particular church. So he begins this with some aspect of the description given in chapter 1. 
What does the right hand in verse 1 of chapter 2 mean? Look at what it says. He says, to the angel of the church at Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Well, the right hand represented dominance for most people, not all people, but for most people, their right hand is their dominant hand. And it, it, has, it represents strength. It's the stronger hand, the more powerful hand. And God, by that, I believe, was representing or symbolizing that I'm giving you authority, I'm giving you power to bring about this change, to um, authoritatively preach this to the church. So it represented strength and power. It represented authority. When Jesus sat down after he ascended up into heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. That symbolizes the right hand of authority. And he gave Jesus Christ that authority over all authority. The pastor has a charge from God and therefore authority from God to teach and preach these truths. He was not, he didn't have the liberty to change it, so, you know, so maybe it wouldn't be as offensive, it would be more accepted. No, he had to give what Jesus Christ gave him to give. It represented a sacred trust for which there would be an accounting. The pastor will give an account someday for what he has taught and what he has preached if he has preached God's word. You know, there are certain circumstances whereby we have people swear on a Bible and they put their right hand on that Bible because what they're doing is such a sacred trust. It's such an important thing. It could be in a courtroom. It could be when a president is inaugurated. It could be when a man is ordained to the gospel ministry and other ministers lay their right hand on him. It's a trust. It's a charge that's being given. And that trust will be, at an account will be uh, required of that trust at the judgment seat of Christ. It also represents fellowship, security, and a loving charge. He held these stars in his right hand. It, there's a sense of fellowship. There's a sense of security. And a pastor takes great security in knowing that he's preaching God's word, not his own word, but God's word. I believe Jesus Christ was communicating his love, yes, accountability, but his love for these pastors in this church, these churches as they addressed the problems. What does walking in the midst of the seven churches represent? Well, I'm going to just two things I want to give you here. First of all, Jesus fervently cares about his church, his body, Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Paul told the pastors of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. See, the church meant a lot to him. These are the body of Christ. These are the people for whom he died. He cares. Secondly, I believe it shows that Jesus knows the condition of the church. He knows the condition because he walks among them. He's paying attention to them. He's observing. And that leads me to say that each message to each church begins with this. I know your works. I know your works. This is not talking necessarily about an individual believer, although each church is a group of individual believers, but of a, a body of believers who 
are going forward and they're, they're working together. God knows all about us. God knows all about Friendship Baptist Church. The one who walks in the midst knows our good works and our bad works. Nothing escapes his notice. He sees it all. Our works and what's motivating our works. That's why 1 Corinthians 10.31 is so important. Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Do all to the glory of Jesus Christ. That means that the final score is with God who knows it all. Let's look at the commendation to this church, this loveless church. He says in verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. First of all, he kind of sums up their faithful perseverance. I know your labor. That's toil until exhaustion. Weary or even, even toiling until there's pain. Now, some people felt that way after moving a lot of trees yesterday. And, but this, this can be physical, but I, I think it's probably maybe emphasizing more the spiritual and emotional exhaustion of a faithful, a faithful people who were um, toiling. They were laboring for the Lord. This church had wearied itself physically, emotionally, spiritually, confronting false teachers and dealing with the fallout of those false teachers among its members. And with all that went on, God was still concerned for them. God was addressing them. You know, there's something very interesting that is, that is missing in this text. And I'd like you to go to 1 Thessalonians. Keep your finger here because we'll just be here for a second. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to read Revelation verse 2 of chapter 2 one more time. It says, I know your works, your labor, your patience. Now look at 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and patience of of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, did you notice anything missing? Yeah, there's several things. He, it's almost like he mentions the same three things, but without the added adjective. And so here he says, I know your, your works, your labor, your patience, but it's not a, a, a labor of love. And he is addressing this problem of lovelessness. So I want you to think about that as we're going through this passage. He didn't call the Ephesians labor a labor of love. He just said it, your labor. And he's still commending them for this though. He's still commending them for their labor and their patience, even though their work maybe could have been more pleasing to him, he does commend them for what they have done. And he, he commends them first. He puts that right at the beginning, telling them how, before he tells them how they need to change. I think we need to do that with others also, maybe our children, maybe a spouse, or another believer that is trying to change and grow but struggles, we need to notice the progress and commend them 
for that which they have made, not just where they need to improve. You know, it might be just they've improved a little bit. Instead of, instead of um, neglecting to do something three or four times, maybe they only did it twice. <laughs> you commend them for that progress. God was commending them. And then he said, I know your patience. And this word means cheerful endurance or constancy. They were faithful and constant in the work of the Lord. They were pluggers. They were people, you, you like people like that, don't you? Faithful people. The church, as we learned in our, when Pastor Minnick was here, the church was right about 40 years old since its founding, and this church had remained faithful to the word of God. And yet God still was, he, he had this issue with them. In a church, we can be standing for the faith. We can be uh, being, we're careful of false teaching and false teachers. We try to be holy, but if we're doing it apart from the love of Christ, we need to evaluate ourselves. Notice their spiritual discernment. I know your intolerance of those who are evil, that you cannot bear those who are evil. That word bear means to endure. You can't endure them. And with, with a, this kind of an evil person, they were not to endure them. They were to deal with it quickly. This is really an unbeliever in sheep's clothing, an apostate. This is what it's talking about. And this word evil speaks of that which is um, morally um, evil in character. And you don't want that to go on. And they did not for a minute tolerate those. When they showed who they really were, when they showed their true colors, they immediately took action. And that demands a knowledge of the word of God because if we don't know the word of God, then we don't know what to do. We don't know how to discern false teachers. And remember, he's talking about the church, not just the pastor here. He's describing the church. These are days today where we find ourselves in challenging days, don't we? in discerning the truth. And people need biblical discernment. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy once again, or for the first time, 2 Timothy chapter 4. I quoted verse 2. Verses 1 and 2, it starts out, I charge you, therefore, verse 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Why are they to do this? Why are they to preach the word? Well, look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So, this is needed. Discernment is needed. Teaching is needed. The word is needed. Preach the word so people learn sound doctrine. They learn how to examine what is truth and what is error. John also wrote of this in, in his first epistle. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now, how are you to test false prophets? Well, look at what he says later in verse 2. He says, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus has come in the flesh is not of God. 
So we discern by doctrine. We discern by the word of God. If you're still in 2 Timothy, turn to chapter 2. And look at verse 15 and following. He's charging them not to strive about words to no profit. And then verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. See, these were the evil men that they were to cast out or else it would spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, those that are for dishonor, which is, he's talking about those false teachers, he will be a vessel for honor if he cleanses himself from these, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So we are... They did right in separating from those brethren. They were doing right. But we need to realize that we can be strong on guarding the church from error and still miss the most important thing, which is loving God. He says, I know you've tested those who say they are apostles. You, can't, you cannot bear them. You have no patience for them because they are false teachers taking advantage of the sheep. And he calls them liars. And the Greek word for liars is pseudo. We call a, a so a false prophet is a pseudo prophet. He, he's a fake. And it's used to mark something that superficially appears to be one thing, but is actually something else. It's untrue, it's false, it's an imitation. Then he says, I know you have persevered and have patience. Persevered is the same word that is translated bear earlier. It means to endure, to persevere. They were patient in trial or testing. The Ephesian church was faithful even when under great testing. They were faithful in putting to test those who wanted to be spiritual leaders. Now, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 20, and we'll notice a very interesting note here that applies directly to this passage. Paul had spent three years in the Ephesian church. It ended with him leaving to go to Macedonia because of the incident that happened at the temple of Diana. And he goes to Miletus, which was just a few miles south of Ephesus. And there he calls for the Ephesian elders to come and meet with him. And this chapter in verse 17 and following are the words that he spoke to them. But I'm going to start in verse 25. Listen to what it says. And indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching, the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify you, to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Remember, Paul took a great, he took this very seriously. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Now friends, that is the same emphasis that Jesus is giving in Revelation 2 when he, he addresses it first to John, but it's actually for the whole church. And so what, what God is actually saying, what Jesus is saying 
when he gives revelation to John, he's saying now, um, or to the pastor of that church, he's saying now you give heed to this first. You make sure that your life meets, is changed by what I'm saying, and then you need to preach it faithfully to the church. Now look at what he says. I'll start again at verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, here's what he said. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Friends, that is exactly what happened over the next 40 years. They experienced these wolves in sheep's clothing. And they were faithful. They were faithful. They they. They judged them by the word of God. They were discerning about that. So Jesus Christ is commending them for that. And we need to realize that. They had persevered. How Paul knew that, I I don't know if, if there was something that he saw or if this was a revelation of God to him that they were, they were going to have trouble with false teachers. Then he says, I know you have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. And I think it's interesting that he even puts in there, you've labored for my name's sake. And yet he still says that they were a loveless church. They carried out, in other words, they carried out the responsibilities in spite of difficulties. And they did this for the sake of Jesus' name. And I'm going to add one other thing, and if you'll go back to um, Revelation now. I'm going to skip down to the end of, it, well, at verse 6, because he commends them for this as well. And it's related to what he he just said. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? Well, one of the... One of the men who was named as a deacon in Acts chapter 6 was named Nicholas. And some of the early church leaders, for instance, Irenaeus, who was the bishop of Lyon in Asia Minor, he was born in 130 AD, which is about 34 years after John died, the writer of Revelation. So there was very little time. Think of thir- that, that's about four years more older than our church is. Okay, it's not a long time. There were probably still people living that had even been in that church. And Irenaeus wrote of that time, he said that the Nicolaeans were followers of Nicholas, one of the deacons in Acts 6, who was a false believer who later came out with his false doctrine. But because he was a leader in the church, he deceived many. And he was able to lead the people astray into immorality and wickedness. Clement of Alexandria says they abandoned themselves to pleasures like goats, leading a life of self-indulgence. Their teaching perverted grace and replaced liberty with license. And the Ephesian church took a stand against them. By the way, the next church, the church of Pergamos, also... um, It talks about the Nicolaitans there. So they hated the Nicolaitans. Those were the commendations. So what was the offense of the loveless church? Well, he says it very briefly. 
All he says is this, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. You have left your first love. How was their commendable works related to their first love? Well, I think what was really happening here is their first love actually became their, their present works, their works, their service for God. But let's learn a few lessons, first of all. The good for which he commended them did not negate the offense. We might tend to be content with our keeping the church pure from error, but the Lord says, nevertheless, nevertheless, I have this against you. And although they may have been sincere, and they were sincere because he commended them, he is just as sincere when he tells them that they have left their first love. Secondly, the good for which he commended them had at one time been accompanied by this first love. They left it at some point. They neglected it as though it was unnecessary. And then thirdly, the good for which he commended them had become more important than their first love. That's why they neglected it. So what was their first love? Well, whatever it was, it was that which they loved first at the time of their salvation. To be a Christian is to love the Lord Jesus Christ and cling to him. To cling to him as your Savior and Lord who cleansed you by his blood who raised you to walk in newness of life. So basically, they had made service for Christ more important than Christ himself. The Christian life to them had become duty and ritual and creed and, yes, a stand. They took a stand. John MacArthur put it this way, their passion and fervency for Jesus Christ had become cold, mechanical orthodoxy. Their doctrine and moral purity, their undiminished zeal for the truth, and their disciplined service were no substitute for the love for Christ they had forsaken. These were people, they would never miss choir rehearsal if they were part of the choir. They would never miss a Sunday school class. They'd be there on Sunday for the Lord's Day They'd find time to be a deacon, but they wouldn't have time with the Lord in prayer and Bible meditation. They were, if they were doing that, it was merely a duty. They had lost their first love. They could spot false teachers a mile away, but there was little warmth in their heart for the Lord. They could join in a debate about doctrine. But if you ask them about their daily prayer life, they'd probably have to bow their head. Jeremiah 2.2 says this, Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, that's Jeremiah, saying, Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your betrothal, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. And then he says later, therefore I will, let, I will yet bring charges, charges against you. Just like in this letter to the Ephesian church, he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. And he says this, has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? But my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. For my people have committed two evils. And that's the passage where he says that they had, they had forsaken him, the living waters, 
for still waters of a broken cistern. And friends, when we neglect time with the Lord, time in personal worship and consecration to the Lord, we leave ourselves open to idols, to other things that will take the place of our Savior. Because we will worship something. We will worship something. You cannot have two masters for you. Either you will love the one and hate the other or vice versa. And when you neglect love for Christ, your service becomes unloving and harsh. Secondly, it was that which they loved most for their entire Christian life. The first love and the first works. Notice here, he says, remember therefore from where you have fallen, remember and do the first works. This love, this first love was, was supposed to be a love that would be there their entire Christian life. But they had neglected it. And so he says, do the works that you did at first. Well, what is... What is that first work? Well, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In Deuteronomy 10, 12, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Your service to be pleasing to the Lord must be an outgrowth of your adoring love for the Lord. That is, to, that is what should motivate our behavior, our work, our service. I think sometimes the people for whom this is most dangerous are those who are second generation Christians. And we grow up hearing about it all of our lives. And it can become second nature to us. And we are sheltered from a lot of things. And there's nothing wrong with that. We should shelter. But there's a, a danger in that. And that is that you can get a false idea that you're more righteous than you are. And it's a, a weakness that we, we must go to extra lengths to avoid. We should shore up those areas. And our homes, our churches should be places where loving Christ is supreme. Now notice what his cure for the loveless church is. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Realize that this is offensive to God. He is addressing a church that was offensive because they were loveless. A church is only as spiritual as the people in it. That includes the pastor, its people, its members. And there may have been exceptions to this in the Ephesian church, but this was how he judged the church overall. Is it possible that this is true of us? It doesn't matter how much you do for God unless you are spending time with him and loving him with all of your heart. And they justified themselves because they were doing it for his sake. But it was all service oriented. It wasn't oriented to Jesus Christ. Do you remember what Paul said in, in Philippians 1? He said, for me to live is what? Yeah, he didn't say it was to serve. Although Paul served as much as anybody did and more. But he said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's a person. That's a person who lives within us through his spirit. 
Their life had become a mechanical performance rather than an act of worship motivated by love and gratefulness. It's kind of the difference between Simon the Pharisee and the sinful woman that came in. And I know Simon was not a believer. I understand that. But do you remember how the Lord summed it up? He said to Simon, after he'd given this story, he said, which of these two individuals will love more? And he said, I suppose the one who's forgiven more. And then he said to Simon, yes, the one who is forgiven much loves much. And the one who is forgiven little loves little. And I think it's wise of us, if we're going to obey this command of remembering, therefore, from where we have fallen, it's remembering our depravity. It's remembering our neediness. And it's remembering that if it weren't for Jesus Christ, we would be far worse. But Jesus Christ saved us, and it is because of him that we are anything. This idea of remember means remember what it was like before you fell away. This idea of fallen, it means to drop away, to be driven out of one's course. And I wonder if there are those here today who remember a time when your love for Christ was fresh, it was vibrant, it was real. You sensed his presence in your prayer life and your Bible study and you saw him guiding your life and you were... You were genuinely seeking him for that guidance. When you read the word, you sensed he was speaking to you. There was living water. It wasn't from a broken cistern. He was transforming your life. You couldn't wait to spend time with him. He's asking us to remember also how we fell away. It happens by making little compromises that show where our love really is. Maybe you start staying up late watching something and you, and so therefore you can't get up early in the morning. Maybe you come, become so busy in your service that you justly, you, you just don't remember, you don't uh, spend time with the Lord. After all, you're doing it for him. For his name. This is what Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians 5 4. He said, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, follow me for a moment. When your service becomes a substitute for your love for Christ, your service has really become almost what you're depending on for the approval of God. There isn't a great deal of difference. Our service for Christ becomes our means of acceptance before God. And so we, we have the sense, well, he, he approves of us. Paul said this in Philippians 3, 7, and 8. He said, but what things were gained to me, those I have counted lost for Christ. And he's speaking of the things that he used to take pride in. His, the fact that he was a Jew and he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and he, he kept the whole law. And then he said this, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of what? Of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Of knowing Christ. That's what he says. In fact, he says, in fact, those things I count as rubbish compared to Christ. You know, by the way you use your day, what gets the top slots of your time? Does the Lord get the best part of your time, your day, or does the Lord get the leftovers? As members of the body of Christ, do we put everything else aside so we can come and worship him on the Lord's day? That's part of our showing the Lord that 
he is the priority. And then he says, repent and do the first works. He uses this word repent twice, which means it indicates how offensive a loveless church is to him. The first works are the love they once had for Christ that moted everything they did. And he's asking us, he's calling us to repent of that sin and repent of any other love in our life which has taken the place of Jesus. And remember how you got to this place. Where did you go wrong? What caused you to fall away from him? Realize the Lord may quickly remove your candlestick. Now again, he's talking about the church. He's not saying that if you're a believer, you can lose your salvation. What he's saying though is a church, if a church loses its love for Christ, it will eventually go apostate. It will not attract other believers or it won't attract other sinners to be saved because the love of Christ is not there. That's a pretty serious consequence. And the Ephesian church is no longer in existence. You can go to the ruins of Ephesus. God's judgment would bring an end to the Ephesian church because Jesus was not the heart of the church. And without Christ, we can do nothing. A loveless church is a dead church because even the children growing up in that church will tend to go astray because of the lack of love. And we must realize how important love for Christ is to the life of the church. Love for Christ affects everything we do. It affects everything. He was speaking of their love for others in using their spiritual gifts in First Corinthians chapter 13, the great love chapter. But the principle applies to our service for God and it applies to our love for the Lord. He said this, all the, all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And faith in Christ produces a love for Christ and a love for all the saints. Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. And he, he prayed this prayer in Colossians, or I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 3, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. See, Paul knew the importance of loving Christ. And that's why this was his greatest prayer for them, that they would come to know the love of Christ in its fullness. The husband is to love his wife as Christ loved the church. In Philippians, he said, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment. You know, sometimes the only thing that will bring us back to an adoring love of Christ is to find ourself in the circumstance of realizing how sinful we are. We fall. And we thought we were a little further ahead than, we, than it appears we are. And we come back to the Lord in repentance and we, we are reminded again of our, of our sinfulness and how much we need him. And we come back and we ask his forgiveness and we express our love for him and our gratefulness. And that you come back and it's almost like you're getting saved again. I'm, I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying you're, you're experiencing once again that, that fresh love for Christ because you've been reminded of how much you need him. Sometimes bitterness about something can cause a person to fall away. Like Eve, she 
She had enjoyed this wonderful fellowship with God. He walked with him in the garden. But then a thought came into her mind through Satan that Satan or that God was withholding something from her. And she ate because she doubted God. There are many things that can lead us away from our love. Pride will do that. Peter fell and he fell hard and he wept over it. But thanks be to God that he restored him, that God restored him. But he was reminded of his depravity, wasn't he? And then, do you remember what the Lord said when he came to him on the shore of the Sea of Galilee? He said, Peter, do you love me? And this time he didn't speak with pride. He just said, Lord, you know I love you. I phileo love you. And then he said, feed my sheep. Friends, I think we can all say that there are times where we really need a fresh understanding of God's goodness and his love for us that causes us to have a refreshed love for him. How is your love for Jesus Christ right now? Is it burning fervently? Is Jesus Christ your number one priority of every day? Is he the most important person in your life? Is he the one that you go to every day to commune with him, to worship him, to get guidance for your day? And you find yourself even praying to him throughout the day because you long to commune with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message that you gave to the church of Ephesus. And I believe, Father, we, we all need to re be reminded of this. And maybe there's someone here today who has lost that love, that first love, that love that is to be foremost a priority. And it should be because it's right, because you are the one who has given us life. You are the one who has forgiven us and saved us and made us a child of God. Father, do whatever it takes and help us, Lord, to do whatever it takes to refresh that love again. Help us to give you first place in our day, in our time, the best of the day. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to turn in your Bibles, not your Bibles, but your hymnals to number 403. The greatest command is to love the Lord with all your heart. And obviously that command cannot be obeyed without the help of God. But let's ask him to show us our need of him and that we would truly love him with all of our hearts. Let's stand as we sing. <clears throat> Though I have great knowledge and truth I understand, even though the mountains hear my voice and bow to my command, though sees above. This will count as nothing without God's work of love. The greatest command of all, the greatest command of all, the greatest command of all my life 
is to love you, Lord, love you, Lord. So increase my love for you as this one thing I do, the greatest of all and all of my life is to love you, Lord. On the last. Though I make great sacrifice and all men know my name, even though I speak to mighty crowds and angels spread my fame, though I serve my fellow men and serve my Lord above, this will count as nothing with the of love, the greatest command of all, the greatest command of all, the greatest command of all my life is to Father, dismiss us now with your blessing, and Father, help us to remember from where we have fallen, and we pray that you would be first in everything, our communion with you would motivate everything we do, in Jesus' name, amen.